Thank you, Dr. Bateman. Thank you very much for setting the stage, really, for what we're going to talk about the rest of today, and certainly tomorrow. So I wanted to remind everybody, um, so at, now that we've heard um, some really in, compelling stories of, of MECF patients and really reflecting some of Dr. Bateman's experience, we're going to move into um, metabolomics and metabolism of MECFS. And really, that fits with the goal of the meeting is to really to present high quality science and at the core of it, which is, relates to what Dr. Koroshetz mentioned and Dr. Auchincloss, is really to better understand the state of the science and the disease and help really drive the field forward by identifying gaps and opportunities. So I think we have tried to identify speakers who can show us some really interesting new data and help us draw conclusions from really some quite diverse aspects of MECFS. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Bob Navio from UCSD, who's been studying metabolism, mitochondria um, for some time, and of course, um, has published some landmark papers in MECFS as well. It's a great pleasure to introduce him. And again, I would remind people uh, there's 30 minutes in, by design here, so there should be a little bit of time for questions. There's microphones in each aisle. If you're not comfortable with the microphones, we do have note cards. And if you have a note card, we'll have someone bring it down to Vicki Whittemore here in the front who will collect them uh, for questions. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Bob Nabil. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, it's really an honor to be here today to um, talk to you a little bit about our work. And um, last time I was here in the Masur Auditorium was over 20 years ago in 1998 when we had just founded the Mitochondrial Medicine Society and Steve Zello had organized the first um, NIH symposium on, on mitochondrial medicine. So we've come a long way since that time. So I want to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to come back. Um, so I'll be talking to you about metabolic features of chronic fatigue syndrome, but really using it as a lens to see the hidden connections to other chronic illnesses, which I think is you know, the major, the, a major challenge for us today. So here's my conflict of interest um, page. Uh, so I'm an unpaged advisor for the Autism Research Institute and the Open Medicine Foundation and MitoQuest. And, and a drug that I'll be talking about today is Suramin. It has no approved uses in the United States, and it's illegal to import Suramin for human use without FDA and IRB approval and uh, uh, an IND. So um, the talk will be organized into three main sections. One is actually on the healing cycle of pathogenesis and treatment of chronic illness. Um, we'll say some words about purinergic signaling, dower, healing blocks, MECFS, and some new work that we're just publishing on Gulf War illness. I'll, I'll finish with a, a, a brief description of the proposed sermon MECFS trial, and, uh, and then I'll end with a, a slide that we were asked to, to include as part of the, uh, the talk, which is a research gaps in, in metabolomics. Okay. So for more information, um, I have some papers. Um, if you're going to choose one, choose the metabolic features and regulation of the healing cycle that was um, published last year. It actually is the number one um, most downloaded paper in the journal Mitochondrion. The number two most downloaded uh, paper in Mitochondrion is a paper called Met Metabolic Features of the Cell Danger Response, which has actually been in the top three for the last five years since it was published. We've recently combined a lot of our work to, to show how incomplete progress through the healing cycle um, is, a, is a cause of, of the aging process itself. And if you want additional information, um, you can go to our website at naviolab.ucsd.edu. So this is a fundamental um, aspect of science that we all face every day. And that is, is that we cannot see what we cannot imagine, okay? So here's a, a little cartoon of a, 
uh, a street light and, and some scientists looking for answers under the street light. But what I really want to point out is the light is, in fact, our imagination. Okay? So what we can conceive of is what we see. And sometimes we don't see an aspect of nature just because it hasn't been part of our model of how disease works. So, so I believe we need a paradigm shift to better understand all chronic illnesses. And the, a fundamental division occurs between the tools we use to, to treat acute illnesses that are brought on by infectious disease, um, toxin exposure, or physical injuries that we become very good at treating. Okay? That leads to symptomatic treatment. But chronic illness is more about the body's response to those injuries than the injuries themselves. And so I would say we need, so whereas for the last 5,000 years, we've relied on book one of medicine, I think we need a book two now to be able to treat chronic illness. So in August of 2016, we published our paper on the met metabolic features of chronic fatigue syndrome. Within one week, a cartoonist had uh, you know, um, come up with this, you know, uh, this nice little cartoon that points out that CFS leaves a telltale signature in the, in the blood. And within a month, you know, Dr. Korshitz was calling me and, and uh, doing his fact-finding mission for um, this new trans-NIH uh, you know, um, initiative that he was um, setting up. And, and within a few months more after that, in March of 2017, we have today the trans-NIH MECFS working group. So to really, it, you know, my, my hat's off and, and you know, um, gratitude to Dr. Korshitz and, and the whole team for putting all this together. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. There was a quote by Theodosius Dobzhansky, a Drosophila geneticist and evolutionary biologist in 1973. Um, nature does not, how should I say, nature utilizes good ideas um, uh, in many different forms. Um, in all in, in life, and and that frequently we can only understand biology by seeing how it allows a species to connect with its ecosystem. Okay, to connect with its ecosystem. Okay, so acute and chronic illnesses are as different as apples and oranges, and I will make this proposition that eliminating or treating a trigger of any chronic illness will not cure that illness if you have not addressed the blocks to the healing cycle itself. And so by unblocking molecular steps in the healing cycle, I think we'll, we'll open a new, uh, a, new, a new chapter in medicine um, to, that will lead to actual cures of chronic illnesses that previously were only treatable. So why can't we cure any chronic illness if we can't cut out or burn out the cause? Okay. So we can treat diabetes with insulin, but insulin never cured anybody with diabetes. We can treat hypercholesterolemia with statins, but statin never cured the underlying propensity to develop dyslipidemia. We could go on with every medicine that's used today, just about with the exception of antibiotics that get rid of, a, of an infectious illness. And, and I would say that we, if we've, so we've been using acute care methods unsuccessfully to cure chronic illness for the past 50 years, and that we'll have the same results for the next 50 years if we don't change our model, our, the imagined model, what we use to guide our experiments. So success in the treatment of CUNIC, um, why is that? Well, it's because success in treating acute illnesses is habit forming. We get used to using the analytical scientific approach to help mitigate symptoms in chronic illness. It's more of an engineering approach. Um, but in the second book of medicine, we have these responses to acute illnesses or acute inter 
injuries, like traumatic brain injury leading to chromatic, chromat, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or UV light leading to melanoma, or Epstein-Barr virus associated with ME-CFS, or a gunshot wound for PTSD. In each case, just removing the trigger does not cure the illness. So what we're really trying to get at is what are the governing dynamics in chronic illness? We've done a great job in modern medicine and systems biology to define very deep silos of knowledge. So, so here are nearly a dozen different um, specific disorders, autism, ME-CFS, Gulf War, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, Lyme, PANDAS, suicidal ideation, aging, and Alzheimer. And we've done all the blue colored um, disorders are disorders, disorders that we've studied. We've done clinical studies in metabolomics to, to try to identify common features. And the point that I'm going to try to make is we can know absolutely everything there is to know about each one of these individual silos and still not be able to cure that disease. Why is that? Because I believe that the diseases share this hidden common feature of the inability to heal from those initial injuries. Okay, so what are some essential facts to understand in the talk? Mitochondria have three developmental forms that undergo programmed interconversion when the cell is injured. M2 mitochondria are those that are specialized for oxfos. That, that's what you're taught about in, in biochemistry. But M1 mitochondria support metabolic features of a cell that has gone glycolytic and that is pro-inflammatory. You need M1 mitochondria in order to mount a defense response against microbial attack. M0 mitochondria are those that are specialized for aerobic glycolysis that are necessary to support biomass replacement and pr cellular proliferation when cells have been lost. Okay, so the cell danger response coordinates all the mitochondrial functions after injury. And the healing cycle is a programmed ontogenetic sequence that has three main steps. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it's coordinated by metabokines that then leverage proteins that then change gene expression. <laughs> All right. So let's see if I can. Oh, OK. All right. So we go from a state of health to a state of chronic illness through usually a perfect storm of many factors for any chronic illness, OK? So sometimes it's a collection of genes that predisposes us, that primes us, to respond unusually to an exposure to a pollutant or to an infection or a heavy metal or poor nutrition. But we get to chronic illness through a number of different paths. These different paths to illness were never programmed into our DNA, OK? Those are the, the result of environmental factors that change throughout our life history. So this process of understanding how these different factors lead to chronic illness is, is pathogenesis, from the Greek word pathos for suffering, illness, or abnormality. And, and what we know is that if we identify and remove pathogens, if we still have a chronic illness, those treatments lead to palliation, not cure. So there is a different path that we have to follow in order to get from chronic illness back to health. That path is genetically programmed. Okay? That path is the result of millions of years of selective pressures that have led to a gene pool that can adapt to environmental injury. Okay? And the important thing to understand is that there is a, let's see, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end to this process. And, and a lot of times, 
physicians and scientists are taught to think in snapshots, not in in dynamics. So, so, so thought to think in statico rather than in video. <laughs> okay. So, so it turns out Darwin recognized that um, that when there are cycles life cycles um, within a given species, um, that there can be carryover effects from inefficient or abnormal um, uh, completion of one cycle. I wish I could point, okay. So if there is an abnormal in initial phase, there can be carryover effects that lead to abnormalities in the subsequent phases of the cycle. Okay, this, this becomes an essential point to understand. So, so the, other, the other thing that's important is to understand that, let's see, that oftentimes if we don't have a name for something, we can't study it systematically, okay? It kind of gets lost as a mist, a fuzzy, as a fuzzy concept. And so Salus was a Roman goddess of personal health, welfare, and safety, and that in order to get back from chronic illness to health, there's a process that in, is, involves salogenesis, which is not, not just the removal of the pathogens that brought you to that illness, but now the adding, the addition of factors that will promote progress through the healing cycle. Okay, so instead of just focusing on pathogens, which we need to, in order to even prevent disease epidemiologically. But once you have it, we also need to talk about salogens and having a systematic pharmacological search for medicines and natural products and, and interventions that can relieve checkpoint abnormalities that have resulted in repeating diseases that are, um, are repeating cycles in each one of these different stages of, of healing. Okay. So this is just to point out that we start with health, we have in injuries, we use the um, uh, basics of first aid to uh, treat symptomatically, and then for thousands of years, physicians have relied upon the, the extreme reproducibility of this process buried underneath this black box. Okay, that process is called healing. Okay. But in a changing world that has more pollution, rewounding, crashes, and molecular blocks, we find ourselves in this repeating loop of chronic illness where 30% of children and 60% of adults are caught in chronic illness. And maybe a way out of that is to unpack this healing process and to understand the molecular details of going from one stage, CDR1, CDR2, CDR3, um, back to health. And then maybe if we do that, we could start having cures of chronic illness. So if, if MECFS is a, a response to a problem, the question what causes it can be a, as complicated as what causes hibernation or what causes dour, okay? Because it's a syndromic evolutionary response to a problem, it has many causes. So here's our, some work that we've done looking at what causes dour, okay? So dour is a, a energy reallocation program, an alternative uh, pathway for the little C, worm C. elegans. They, um, will go from an early stage of development to this alternative dower stage, which allows it to live for four months instead of its normal two-week life cycle. What are the triggers? Well, you can trigger it with overcrowding, caloric restriction, hypoxia, predator stress, dehydration, heat stress, parasite, microbial infections. Okay. And so when we look at the metabolomics, of eggs and all the different stages of, of C. elegans, if we apply stress, we can enter into this dour, dour phase, 
And then we can exit the dour phase and see what metabolic and chemical changes are, are, are required. It turns out that the path back to health to, to young adults is different than the, the normal path that got you to health. Okay. And it's also not a reversal of the pathway that got you into dour. So here are a lot of different points of, about dour, and I'm just going to jump to the bottom, which is sur surprising to many, is that the worms in dour have hypersensitivity with increased cutaneous um, uh, chemoreceptors that will result in a, some, a, a refractory period after a stimulus that is, you, you could think of as looking at like post-exertional malaise, where they will, after, after they have been touched or stimulated, they will not be able to respond to that um, for a long period after the, after the stimulus until they recover. Okay, so here's a, um, here is a metabolomic analysis of the different stages of, of um, development in the C. elegans from L1 through adults, and looking at how a different specific metabolites change from dour to recovery, okay? And so in some cases in acetylcholine, dour has lower levels and must rise. And other, other, dis, other metabolites like 3-methylhistidine, um, it has a higher level of 3-methylhistidine that must decrease. Hypoxanthine is a purine base that starts out very, very low and has to increase. And I'll leave it at that for this. And, and this is just to point out that Dower is just one example of a an highly evolved reprogramming of metabolism that allows different organisms to survive environmental stress. So in bacteria, for example, Lyme and TB both have persister cells where they decrease their metabolic rate to make them resistant to environmental stresses or antibiotics. Other phenomena that you can look up are diapause, hibernation, torpor, estivation, tune in the tardigrade, dour is what we study. But it, Basically, it leads to the very, these very same the core metabolic pathways of energy reallocation for survival. Okay, the, pro the fact that healing is a process, an ontogenetic sequence, not a state, is so fundamental that you will make mistakes if you forget this, okay? So, we studied a, a, a mouse called the MRL mouse that had very unusual um, healing properties. It, but if you used an a ear punch to identify the animal, it would, it would heal that up in a month, um, replacing nerve, cartilage, muscle, sebaceous glands, um, every one of, of tissues that are derived from the three primordial germ layers. And when you injure it, this, this is a western blot that shows um, mitochondrial protein concentrations. Um, immediately post-injury, mitochondrial protein translation is dramatically decreased. And then 10 days afterwards, it's restored. Okay, so here is this healing cycle that we normally go through for wakeful activity and nutrition intake. We, our cells will release a certain amount of extracellular ATP that's metabolized to adenosine, which we need to initiate sleep. And when that is consumed, then we wake up again and we normally cycle through there. When there is a more significant injury, then we enter into the very first stage of, of uh, the healing cycle, which inv is involved in containment and innate immunity that involves glycolytic metabolism. Let's see. Um, once the healing cycle is complete, the extracellular ATP has been reduced, and we, we go back to the, the health cycle again. The, the underlying metabolic features of each stage allow for the, the steps of that stage to be completed. So 
we have to have glycolysis before aerobic glycolysis, before oxfos, and before a reblending of all of the different metabolic states during the circadian, during circadian rhythms. And chronic fatigue syndrome and, and autism appear more to be a block toward the end of CDR3 in the work that we're doing. Okay, so here are mitochondria. In health, mostly in oxfos M2. During inflammation, they go glycolytic, become M1, rise to M0, and then those fall as the cells have been replaced and stem cells have been recruited, and, and, and then M2 mitochondria are, are um, restored. So those are go under, under names, but inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling. But the, the key concept here that is that if you are a metabolic lab and you look at a disorder that is in, let's say, an, infl an inflammatory disorder that is in this stage, and you're comparing it to healthy controls, you forget that you can't go from CDR1 back to health. You actually have to proceed through the other two steps. So knowledge of where a person is stuck doesn't actually tell you exactly the path to recovery. Okay? That has to be, that's part of this hidden biology, the, the root causes that underlie virtually every chronic illness. And now I'll make a, a, a couple more points as we finish. So, um, so the context of exposure to, the, uh, to a CDR trigger dramatically determines the outcome. This happens to be a, a slide that indicates um, the odds of d coming home with Gulf War illness if you've been vaccinated either before deployment, which is this gray line, or received the same vaccinations after deployment. So it turns out that there's a, a five to almost 20 times increased risk of coming home with Gulf War illness if you receive those vaccinations, in this case, you know, more than six, after the stress of the war theater was encountered, okay, compared to those that received the same vaccinations before. All right, so here's a, a nice figure. This is a genetically modified um, mustard plant, uh, Arabidopsis, that will fluoresce when free calcium is um, released. And here's a little cricket bite. And if you add either glutamate or ATP, um, that injury is signaled to the, to the rest of the plant, okay? Um, so why ATP and glutamate? They have very high concentrations inside the cell, but very low concentrations immediately outside the cell. So that when a cell is injured and releases these molecules, it's a very clear signal that there has been damage. So this is a, a summary of Gulf War metabolomic pathways, metabolic pathways compared to chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, there are uh, some shared pathways that involve sphingolipids, phospholipids, and branched-chain amino acids. But it turns out that in Gulf War illness, those typically are increased increased um, uh, standing pools of these metabolites and are decreased in chronic fatigue syndrome. The only thing that was the same were that purines were decreased in both. We've done a, a validation study of our first study of chronic fatigue syndrome that has identified, again, fatty acid oxidation, ceramide, and glycosphingolipid metabolism as being very important, and purine metabolism, also bile salt metabolism, and microbiome, I'll, and, and sphingomyelin, SAMSA. Many of these are the same players that, that you've seen before. So we went looking. Turns out every stress cell re releases ATP and other metabolites um, through stress-gated channels, in this case I've illustrated Panexin P2X7, that are opened under increasing oxidative um, stress, but uh, specifically by 
converting free thiols to disulfide bonds. And then also by changing the biomechanical properties of the lipid rafts in which the, the, the transporters exist. So mitochondria talk to the nucleus through a short path retrograde, and they coordinate. There's also a long path retrograde signal that involves the release of these molecules for, that can be traced to mitochondria and bind to receptors that then change gene expression. So we ask this question, if there's a, if there's a dissipative loss of ATP from the cell, what would happen if we had a drug that might be able to block that release of ATP from the cell? There would be more ATP that, that could be used inside the cell for um, purposes of growth and healing. And it turns out recently there's been an identification of a P2X4 um, receptor uh, that is you know, upregulated in chronic fatigue syndrome patients compared to controls. So when we went looking, there was one drug. That drug was Suramin that would, could be an inhibitor of extracellular ATP signaling through some of the, one of the well, several of the 19 purinergic receptors. And that, just to, to illustrate this, I have a little video. So we did a clinical trial of low-dose sermon in five boys with autism and five controls. Um, it's a 100-year-old drug that's been used to actually treat African sleeping sickness. Um, it's no accident. Sleeping sickness is actually an infection-related chronic fatiguing syndrome you know, related to a, a persistent infection. Here's a, um, a, a cartoon of a neuron with a nucleus and mitochondria and channels that allow for ATP release and for um, and receptors that bind to the to those that bind to ATP that triggers the cell danger response and the neurons will then go into a survival mode if you treat with suramin the idea is to block the ATP production and to to then allow the, the cells to maintain more of that more of that uh, molecule in order to, to heal. So we've had this IND approval, FDA approval, for a, a, a Suramin MECFS remission recovery trial for three years. And it's only in the last you know, year that we have the ability to, um, well, that we have new Suramin and, and uh, a new sponsor that is going to help with funding this. And I'll, I'll just give you a brief idea that we'll randomize into two different arms. There'll be two doses over two months, and then we'll look at outcomes before and after. So that is the end of uh, the main talk. And then this last part is um, just a discussion of um, analytical and biological gaps in metabolomics um, that is um, something important for the field to develop. I know I'm five minutes over, um, but I will um, maybe just save this for question and answer um, later, and, and some of the people doing metabolomics um, can really get into the nitty-gritty of these. And then I want to say thanks to all of our supporters. This work has been supported by over 2,000 grassroots supporters all around the world and a number of private foundations, including the uh, Open Medicine Foundation. And, and most importantly, I'd like to, to, um, uh, to give th thanks to a little girl named Christine Shimizu who had Lee syndrome and died in 1998, um, whose life and memory has inspired every discovery we've ever made over the last 25 years. So thank you.